I can't save them all, or can I? And that's our lesson for today as we come face to face with the most revolting computer ever to darken the door of the cave. Do caves have doors? Anyway, gloves are required. Let me show you the health hazard that is the Commodore PC-20. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, but they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. Ugh, it's a filthy... Commodore branded PC. The Commodore Amiga 1000 when it came out famously had Andy Warhol at his launch. This looks like it's met Jackson Pollock somewhere along the line. Uh, hello cave dwellers, welcome into the lab. This you may be wondering how did it get into this state and can it be saved? That's the big question for today as we do an exploratory uh, episode if you like to see if this can become a fully fledged trash to treasure or if it's a lost cause. Is it as bad on the inside as it looks on the outside? So where did it come from is the first question. Well, there is a place somewhere in the UK. I don't know where it is. It's all being kept very secretive at the moment. And it's a barn, as far as I can tell, with a collapsed roof, which is full of retro treasures. Now, the people who have access to it are slowly sifting through it, sorting through it. And I've managed to buy a few things from the hoard over the last month or so, including more cardboard backed budget games from the 80s and 90s to go in the fake shop here, because these were such a big part of my childhood. I, I, I'll buy as many of these up as I can find and they just look great on the peg to invoke those feelings of being back there and uh, give us an authenticity to my fake retro store. And I just could not resist this, which I bought from the hoard, a new old stock Shadow of the Beast 2 published by Psygnosis with that beautiful Roger Dean artwork, and it still has inside it the sealed t-shirt that came with it. This is something of a holy grail for me, and I'm so pleased to add it to the collection. I've got to find a glass cabinet in which to put this on display so people can come and enjoy looking at it. And those are just a couple of examples of thousands upon thousands of incredible things that were at this hoard. In the near future, I'm hoping to meet somebody who's involved in that, and they're going to do a show and tell for us. But right now they're still keeping it very hush-hush until they've sifted through it all. And I can understand why. They don't want people turning up in the middle of the night and emptying their, um, their treasure trove. So you can expect more on that later. However, this came from the very same place. Now it's obviously not new old stock like that Shadow of the Beast. It's in a very different condition. Let's take a look then at the outside and then we'll pop the lid off and see if there's any hope at all of saving this. Regardless of where this journey takes us today, let's be sure to use it as a chance perhaps to learn about the background of Commodore's PC range, which dates all the way back to 1984. Now ours is a PC-20 Model 3, which was released in 1988, and by then it was becoming clearer and clearer that IBM PC clones were dominating the business market. But it was a cutthroat industry which pitched Commodore against very low-cost Far Eastern competition, even some competition closer to home here in the form of Amstrad and their low-cost PCs. IBM PC clones were everywhere. It offered value for money by integrating such things as parallel and serial ports, as well as Hercules, MDA and CGA video output, a hard disk controller and 640k of RAM out of the box. It even had a battery backed up clock, as we'll see shortly. The manual tells us that the PC-10 and the PC-20 Series 3 are exactly the same thing, with the 10 housing two floppy drives and the 20 housing a floppy drive and a hard disk as standard which is why the label on the back refers to both 10 and 20 models. It's essentially the same thing. Let's take a look around then. There is an AT keyboard connector on the side next to a reset switch. This didn't come with a keyboard, so we may be on the hunt for one at a later date. And as we look around the back, we find even more bird poo, as well as a mouse port, which the manual says is Microsoft mouse and Commodore 1352 mouse compatible. The 1352 being what we more commonly know as the Amiga tank mouse. Yep, you can plug an Amiga mouse straight into this PC and it will work. Next to it is a composite video out, 
and then the RGBI video port, which has switches to configure the type of output you want. So color, monochrome, 40 or 80 columns, and you can disable it entirely if you want with those switches, perhaps if you've added a third party video card. Aside from the serial and parallel ports, we see a sticker indicating a 40 megabyte hard disk. Now, from what I can find, it appears 20 megabytes was the standard configuration, so we've got a little bit more here than standard, as well as bonus rust on the ISA port blanking plates. Yummy. That's all cosmetic though, a bit of rust here, a pebble dashing of guano there. Hopefully that will all clean up and we won't find any nasty surprises under it. We will get to that later. But if it's all turned to mush inside, then we're not gonna get very far. So I think we should take the lid off and see what we're dealing with here. I was expecting to find a rotting mess on the inside, maybe even a rat or two inside it, but it appears to have been largely protected from the elements with no way in. But that elation didn't last long because while it was protected from the elements on the outside, there were some dangers on the inside. While I can't yet see a battery, there are signs of corrosion on the board from a leak. Not being able to see the battery is a bad sign because it means that its damaging fingers has worked their insidious way through the board to get here from wherever it is located. It's hard to say how bad the damage is really. There's dust and there's dirt on the board, so we don't really know yet if the damage is just on the surface or if it has penetrated past the solder mask through into the traces. I don't know if there's a respectful ceremony I should be following for an arachnid, but let's just pretend I followed it if there is. So to find out how the damage is here, we really need to see the whole board. So let's strip down the machine, take everything out and whip that board out. And here is that battery. It was at the front of the board tucked away under the drives, which means the corrosion we saw was on the opposite side of the board. It's got that far, which is not a good sign. Notice the discoloration on the board, the corrosion around the legs of components and the traces. It's, it's not looking great. Let's keep poking around in here and We'll learn a bit more about the machine as we do. So we've got a Revision 6.2 board and Commodore have used a combination of off-the-shelf parts as well as some parts from its own MOS technology manufacturing plant to make this cost efficient. This 5720 chip, for example, is labeled the Franken Mouse. It's an MIO or mouse and input output chip. It's produced by MOS and between that and the Faraday chip, the mouse ports, peripherals, and the bus are managed. These two are basically managing everything that's going on on the motherboard. The CPU here is a Siemens branded 8088. This can run at 4.77 megahertz, so just like the original IBM XT that it's cloned. It can run at 7.16 megahertz in turbo mode and 9.54 megahertz in double mode. And those modes were activated using a keyboard combination. There was no turbo buttons on the front of the PC to press. It was just a, a soft switch to enable that. There's also an empty socket next to it for an 8087 coprocessor if you wanted to do the math, as our American friends say. Hard disk and floppy disk controllers are both on board. A 360K 5.25 inch floppy drive made by Chinon is present and the PC20 shipped with MS-DOS 3.3, or at least this PC20 Model 3. Earlier versions in the range, of course, came with earlier versions of MS-DOS. Let's continue to strip this down now and see how deep the damage goes. And of course, that battery needs to come out. So we'll give that a snip. It needed to come out 20 years ago, in fact, but we don't have a time machine yet. And when we do, this channel is really gonna go places. The underside of the board reveals more signs of leakage, unfortunately. It's not just sitting on the surface on the top. It's worked its way all around through the vias. This is a two layer board. There are no layers wedged, sandwiched between the top and the bottom layer. So we at least have that going for us. The corrosion is what we can see. We'll push on though. Let's complete the strip down so out comes that original hard drive and that floppy drive and as you can see it's a fairly minimal construction there are three metal parts to the case and then there's the front plastic fascia very easy to take apart and work with 
I think the PSU is worth checking out, so let's take a peek inside that now. And as we do look inside, we can see there's evidence of our feathered friends nesting in the barn in which this was found. There are feathers on the board and there are some in the fan here. Thankfully though, the main addition to the PSU is just dust and dirt. The corrosion hasn't worked its way into here. And all I needed to do was give it a blast with the blower. And a bit of a brush and it looked to be in great condition. I checked the fuse, that's intact. And I can't see any bulging or cracked capacitors. Nothing really of concern here. So I'm happy to fire this up and test it. My first test with the PSU, I had some load applied in the form of a hard disk and also my PSU tester plugged in just to give it some load and check that it was stable and given us good voltage. And I came up with some confusing results, but guess what? Batteries again. Yes, the batteries in my meter were low because when I checked it for my own sanity with another meter, I found that the 12 and the five volt rails were absolutely solid. They were just fine. So I put some new batteries in my own meter which is just a consequence really of my tools being packed away for so long since before we built this lab. Um, yeah, I'll check all the batteries on every tool I have that needs them checked before we uh, make that mistake again. The PSU is good then, that's something. Let's clean the board now and see how deep the damage goes because I really wasn't feeling confident about this. So I brushed down the dirt and I neutralized all of the visibly corroded areas with some acid in the form of white vinegar brush that around all of the components, all of the component legs, try to wash it around underneath some of those components and just try and neutralize what we could. Before long, I was basically given the whole board a vinegar bath as I spotted more and more corrosive specks all over it. Then I rinsed it down with distilled water and PCB cleaner. And I thought, yeah, this still needs a closer look. I should get a second opinion before just plugging this thing in. So I popped our system downstairs to the Retro Repair Lab. Now this is a service we'll be piloting very soon where you will be able to book in and bring in your own retro for the experts associated with the electronics company downstairs to actually work on it. Won't be me, it will be proper boffins working on repairing your retro. We're nearly there. There'll be a video on that soon because we're We've got the lab, we've got the technicians, we've got the equipment. We're just trying to tie up a few things before we work out how we run it properly before launching it and then finding we can't quite do it properly. So give us a bit of time. But um, the point is those resources are all down there. And I thought, let's take this down for a second opinion and see what they have to say. So Holly was working down there on this day and I went over the schematics. She'd anticipated my visit and printed off the schematics for the PC20. And uh, we started off by agreeing that we needed to give the board another good clean, this time with the ultrasonic cleaner to really shake loose any remaining dirt. And then we took a look under the microscope and I'm afraid the news went from bad to worse. Everywhere, and I mean everywhere we looked on the board, we saw discoloration, not just on the solder mask on the top, but on the traces themselves. And as we stripped that back with a fiberglass pencil to take a closer look, we could see that pretty much every trace I'm not exaggerating here. Every trace all over the board was pitted and damaged and the continuity was lost in many, many places along the same trace. The corrosion had gone just too deep and it had caused some real damage. In conclusion, the only way this would work would be if this board had days or weeks of work to strip it back and make sure that all of the corrosion was dealt with, taking off all the components, applying hundreds of patch wires or bridging small breaks in all of the areas of the traces with a bit of solder to patch them back up, putting new components on, hoping everything worked. It's not technically impossible, but you wouldn't see me for a few months. I, and I still might return with a non-working machine at the end of it. And those are not my words. Those are the words of the electronics boffins in the basement. So where does that leave us with our repair? Well, I'm not the type of person that will push back against people who know better than me. And those boffins downstairs certainly do know better than me. So um, I, I take every word that they tell me about how many days, how many weeks, how much effort it would take to bring this back to life. And this isn't the only one like it. It seems when I do my research, there are loads and loads of people in the same situation because of the battery 
situation, please, 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 whether it's a PC20, whether it's um, an Acorn Archimedes, an Amiga 500 Plus, snip those batteries out. You, you've heard me say it a million times, this is a prime example of what happens when you don't. Should have been taken out years ago. So where do we go? Well, while I was pondering this, I thought, well, let's, let's at least try and clean up that case, that case that was all covered in bird poo. I used something a bit more industrial than my usual car shampoo to clean this up. This is Ubic 2000, which is a bit more of an industrial cleaner. It says it's designed to cut through grease, grime, oil, fat, carbon, nicotine, inks, dyes, blood, sugars, starch, mildew, etc. I mean, this is serious stuff. And um, all I did was put it in a tub for 15 minutes with that diluted with some water, gave it a good soak and then just wiped it down. I didn't video it because I took it home at the weekend and did it in my garden and there was not much to see other than the case in a tub. Quick wipe down because that chemical, I mean, make sure you wear gloves if you use that stuff because it's, it really is an irritant, but that chemical worked wonders. Let me show you the result. Here it is how it was before with 30, 35 years of dirt, grime, poo, rot all over it. I didn't think there was any coming back from this. And this is what it looks like now. Now, at the start of this episode, I said there is no way that this is new old stock in the same way like that Shadow of the Beast 2 box was, which was new old stock. But I'm changing my mind here. I think that this may have never been used. If you look at the top of it, there are no signs that a monitor has ever been on that top, scratching it up or anything like that. This thing is mint. The only imperfection I can really pick out is just above the case badge on the front. There's that little scratch and I think I can maybe work that out or at least get the colour out of that with a little bit of delicate work. But come on, that is nothing compared to the state we found it in. And I think this was maybe not necessarily boxed new old stock, but I mean, it's as new as any system I've ever seen that's that old. Look at it. I did notice something very odd about this case, which I haven't seen on Commodore cases before, which is around the edge here, you can see that the, um, the paint uh, lifts away if that is in fact paint because this looks more like a vinyl wrap to me. If you look at it, the um, the edges, well the edges aren't coloured, the edges of the metal. Uh, let me show you another example around the back of the case here. You can see uh, the colour goes right up to the edge of the join but then there's no colour on the edges um, which you would expect if it had been painted. So this is a bit odd, and I compared it to a PC-10 Series 3, same era, there's only 20,000 between it and this in terms of serial numbers. You can see the paint on that one goes all the way around the edge. So that is definitely yeah, a powder coated paint job. Here's another PC-20, and this one looks just like mine. The color goes up to the edge and then it stops. So the question is, is this paint or is this a vinyl wrap? Um, and it's a really interesting question for me because I've got that black, badly painted Amiga 4000, which I need to do something with. And if it's good enough for Commodore to vinyl wrap a machine like this, is it good enough for me to vinyl wrap an Amiga 4000 if I can get the right color? It's an interesting question and one we may explore when we get to it. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd point it out as a bit of an oddity. So that really did inspire me. I've got this perfect case. I've got a working power supply. Is it worth going to the effort of, of, of stripping this board? And then I remembered a couple of chaps by the name of Rob and Chrissy, and I got in touch with them. Now, these guys are important because they're the guys that created the A500 Plus Plus board. If you remember when we created the world's newest Amiga several years back and soldered all that up, they're the guys that were behind that lovely purple A500 Plus Plus board. They've since gone on to um, uh, reverse engineer many, many boards, including most recently the Acorn Archimedes 3000. That's one they've just done. So I said, how do you fancy doing a PC20 board? And they've taken on the challenge. So what's gonna happen next is instead of repairing this board, we are going to make a sacrifice to the Commodore gods in the name of helping hopefully, not just myself, but many other people out there who have had the same problem. And hopefully we can capture this process with them and make it into an episode further down the line. It's gonna take a couple of months. This isn't gonna happen overnight, but we'll follow their progress in stripping it down recreating the board in their software and then we'll get a run of them printed off new PCBs and then we'll put all the sockets on and um, transfer these chips over and we're going to have a brand new PC20 board to put in our case which looks brand new and uh, then we just need to find a keyboard to go with it and that will be our restoration. Slightly different approach and I know some of you will be looking at that and going send it to me give me a chance to strip it back and to fix it 
but why not use it as an opportunity to help lots of other people out there who may be in the same boat as me and get more PC10s and more PC20s up and running with a brand new board. So that's what we're going to do. That's the conclusion to our episode today. And um, as soon as we've made some progress on that, hopefully I can show you it up and running and we can have a good old session with a big jug of coffee, tea maybe actually, because too much coffee makes my hands shake when I'm soldering. And we can solder it all up like we did with that A500++ and put it back in that beautiful case. That's the plan. So a big thank you to Rob and Chrissy um, for agreeing to that. And I'll keep you updated on our progress and we can get this beautiful machine back up and running. Until then, thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode and take care. Bye-bye.